Okay, so this is the second vodcast in the digestive system. Um, the third one following will be on enzymatic action. Um, so looking at the accessory organs. Now these are accessory to the digestive system because they don't have food that actually passes through these um, these organs, they just contribute substances. And so here are three um, accessory organs. Here's the pancreas here, this structure um, here. Um, and you can see here that this is where it's going to release through this duct into, this is the first part of that small intestine, the duodenum. Um, and then we also have via a duct. Um, we have this duct here that um, is substance are secreted from this gallbladder. Then we also have the liver which is um, produces the substance that gets stored in the gallbladder. So let's get started on breaking these down a little bit more detail. Alright, so the pancreas is a unique organ in that it has both an endocrine function and an exocrine function. Now an endocrine function, what that means is that um, substances are released directly into the blood. So this is directly into the blood. So here we're talking about hormones that are produced by the pancreas that are then released into the blood and they specifically move from the blood uh, from the pancreas into um, the liver and so we have two things that happen when we have high blood sugar levels um, we get a release of insulin so this is a hormone that will move from the pancreas to the liver and what happens is it causes um, the excess glucose that's in the blood to be stored as glycogen now remember glycogen was um, one of our polysaccharides um, and it was the, our storage form of energy that, hap that occurs in our liver and so it takes up our excess glucose what will also happen is that it also promotes the formation of fats as well as um, causes those cells of the liver to absorb that glucose and therefore it removes it out of the blood and therefore drops our um, blood sugar levels. Now, if we have low blood sugar, um, we have this other hormone released from the pancreas called glucagon. Now, glucagon will again move from the pancreas via the blood to the liver. That causes the liver to take that storage form of glycogen, um, that storage form of, of glucose, which we call glycogen, and break it down into glucose. When it does that, it releases the glucose into the blood. So the liver will release the glucose and therefore it will increase our blood sugar levels. So this is a way for our, um, this is the liver's function is to maintain that blood sugar concentration of glucose. Now difficulties with insulin production or um, not enough insulin being produced or problems with the insulin receptors in the liver um, can lead to conditions of diabetes. Now we have two sets of diabetes. We have a juvenile onset, which is type 1, and we have adult onset, which is type 2. Now both of these can be controlled with diet um, and it results in the regulation of blood glucose levels. And so here's that exocrine function. So this is the second function of the pancreas. So exocrine means that we secrete um, the products into ducts rather than directly into the blood. So this here, we're talking about all of those enzymes that were produced in the pancreatic juice that we've already reviewed in the first vodcast. So the pancreas will produce this pancreatic juice. So its source comes from the pancreas. Its site of action of all of these enzymes and this one substance um, is in that duodenum, that first part of the small intestine. Um, so the easy way to remember these is salt plus N. So these letters stand for all of these substances here that are released from the pancreas in the pancreatic juice. Now these all come via a duct, the pancreatic duct that will release into the duodenum. So let's talk about these substances. First off we have sodium bicarbonate. Now sodium bicarbonate um, will act as a base in order to neutralize that acidic chyme. So remember the acidic chyme, which was made acidic by the stomach, um, gets released in, sm in small spurts um, from that pyloric sphincter coming from the stomach. And so entering into the duodenum, the first thing we want to happen is we want to neutralize that acid chyme so that the acid chyme doesn't begin to um, begin to damage the cells of the small intestine. So it changes it to a slightly, um, a slightly basic pH of about 8.5, and, and that's the pH of our small intestine. Therefore, it is also the optimal pH in which each one of these enzymes function at. 
So our first enzyme, pancreatic amylase, similar to salivary amylase, except for that it's pancreatic, released from the pancreas, but functions in the small intestine. This will convert starch into maltose. Our second enzyme that, that is released from the pancreas here is the lipase. Now lipase converts the lipids, the, the polymer, into its monomer forms of fatty acids and glycerol. The third enzyme, trypsin, which has its inactive form of trypsinogen and does get converted to trypsin, just like pepsinogen and pepsin, um, and also actually acts on the same um, polymer. And so it acts on proteins, breaking them down into peptides. And the last enzyme is the nucleases. So the nucleases will take those nucleic acids, the RNA and the DNA, and break it down into nucleotides. The second accessory organ is the gallbladder, um, and it is shown here as this little green projection. You can see it has two ducts, um, one of which it, it looks like it has a connection with the liver as well as also a connection that will lead in through a duct into that duodenum, the first part of that small intestine. So the function of the gallbladder is to store and send bile um, into the small intestine and that goes via the bile duct. And so what the what bile does is it breaks down lipids into smaller particles. So it's like breaking down large pieces of fat into small pieces of fat. Um, and this is a process called emulsification. We talked about this in Unit 1 where we were talking about um, soap being used, that it, soap breaks down large pieces of oils and grease into smaller bits of oils and grease so that it can be washed away. Um, same action here. So it's taking lipids, large fat, and breaking it down into smaller fat in the process of emulsification. And so here I'm coming back to that original slide so that I could show you a picture of how these um, are related. So here again, you see the gallbladder here, which will receive the bile that was produced in the liver. Um, and so it will release the bile and through a duct into that first part of the duodenum, that first part of the small intestine. Here is also that duct that will, that will um, allow the pancreatic juices to travel from the pancreas, their site of their source, into their small intestine, which is their site of action. Okay, so that third accessory organ is the liver. Now, that, that gallbladder receives the bile um, that is made in the liver, and it restores it in the gallbladder before releasing it into the small intestine. Now, the liver also has a quite a few other functions. One of the important ones is to, um, it acts as a gatekeeper to the blood. And so therefore, it is going to be responsible for maintaining blood um, concentrations, um, nutrient levels within the blood. So how it does this, um, as you can see here, here is the liver, this large portion here. Here's that gallbladder that's sitting upwards here. And you can see there is a blood connection between the intestines and the liver. Now, remember that the small intestine, it is um, the place where the majority of chemical digestion occurs, but it is also the place where all of the absorption of all of these nutrients occurs. Remember, each of those projections, those villi, um, have a blood capillary in it. All those blood capillaries will move up into the liver. And so that's how the liver is able to act as a gatekeeper to the blood by keeping those nutrient levels consistent because it receives those nutrients that have been absorbed in the small intestine. And so this connection from one organ to another organ, it's a portal rather than being um, directly for to and from the heart. Um, so therefore we call it the hepatic and hepatic just means liver. So the hepatic portal vein, which is the connection from the intestines um, into the liver. So it's a hepatic portal vein. And here's one more diagram just showing you the breakdown. Um, here is the small, in, here's the small intestine, here's the part of the large intestine, and here's that hepatic portal vein that you can see leads directly from the small intestine up into the liver. So the small intestine will absorb these products of digestion. The nutrients then travel via the hepatic portal vein. The liver, to, the liver will monitor the blood content um, and therefore release or um, or hold on to some of those nutrient level nutrients in order to maintain those levels of nutrients within the blood. So here is a very quick, brief synopsis of the six functions of the liver. The easiest way that I find to remember this is B, 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 
B, B, U. So if you can remember all these B's and then that one U, that hopefully will help you to remember. So let's review these. First off, we've already talked about how it regulates blood sugar levels through that use of insulin and glucagon. If blood sugar is too high, insulin is released, glucose is pulled out of the blood, stored in the liver as glycogen. If blood glucose levels are too low, glucagon is released, and therefore, um, or glucagon is released from the pancreas, moves to the liver, and causes glycogen to be broken down into glucose, which is then secreted into the blood so that our blood sugar levels can be maintained. The second function is looking at detoxifying the blood. And so this is, for example, how it turns alcohols into fatty acids. And so our liver acts as a, detox as a detoxification system. Over time, with consistent chronic use of alcohol, um, that liver tissue can lead to scarring, and that scarring is called cirrhosis. So if you've ever heard of some people who are suffering from cirrhosis, it can be caused by um, the consistent need to detoxify um, the blood um, based off of alcohol consumption. Third function, which we've already talked about, is bile production, which is a reminder, bile will be produced by the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and released into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, and its function is to emulsify fats, which is breaking large fats into small fats in order to increase the surface area for the chemical digestion of lipids. The fourth function of the liver is to produce um, blood proteins, for example, an, um, a blood protein called fibrinogen, which is involved in blood clotting. Um, another blood protein, is an example, is albumin, which helps maintain um, basically water pressure, osmotic pressure within the blood. The fifth function is to destroy old red blood cells, and so it's blood cells, red blood cells specifically, break down, um, and therefore it is able to recycle the hemoglobin that exists in those red blood cells. So recycles hemoglobin. And the last function is urea production. Now, urea gets produced um, from what we call the deamination. I'll write that down. Deamination. Um, of amino acids. And so um, our liver has the ability to convert amino acids into glucose if needed um, in order to um, maintain a certain amount of blood glucose levels, which as you know is our energy form that we need um, in order for our cells to utilize for cellular respiration. Um, so this is to maintain those blood glucose levels. Now in this uh, production of um, deaminating amino acid, a byproduct um, is urea. And so that byproduct of urea can be toxic at large and high levels. Um, byproduct is urea. And therefore, um, that, that urea is going to be removed by our kidney so that it be, doesn't become toxic levels and uh, maintain toxic levels in our body. And that brings us to the end of our second vodcast for the digestive system on accessory organs. Um, the third vodcast will talk about enzymatic actions within the digestive system.